we're going to look at um, long-running tasks. Um, and with that, uh, how you can handle long-running tasks so that they don't cause your application to freeze. From there, we'll look at um, using web APIs, which uh, can take some time to respond because we're going over a network and we don't know what the network conditions are going to be like. So we'll look at making calls to uh, an API uh, using just the standard things that are available to us in Android. Uh, and then we'll move on to look at how we can use like a, a library from elsewhere to uh, simplify those kind of things. So if we do a long-running task um, and we run it, we just write the code for our long-running task in, may, say, our main activity uh, and don't need to do anything particular, um, our activity could freeze up. Okay. So um, I can show you a brief example of that. I can write some uh, badly written code, uh, and we'll see what happens. So um, let's just jump into Android Studio. Um, and I'll just create a new empty application. I'll call it um, slow app. And I'll start with an empty activity. Um, and what I'm going to build it to do is to uh, very badly generate a random number. Okay. Um, now, obviously, there is a random um, uh, implementation available to us, but we're we're going to kind of misuse it and make a really slow, slow version of that. Um, just because I can't think of any valid uh, long-running task to do. Um, typically, if we want, to, if we got like large data, and we need to perform some sort of complex operations on it. That could be slow. Um, I'm just going to write something that's just not particularly good um, to do that today. So. I'll just start off by creating an application with just a button and a text view. Let's pop that up there. Um, and here's my text view. And I'll just infer constraint. Um, and I shan't worry about changing the, the labels or things for the moment. But what I will do is attach um, uh, an action to the button uh, on click. Um, and we'll, I don't know. We'll call it um, get random. Okay, so we've got that, and in my main activity, I'll implement that get random method. Um, which pass a view as a parameter, uh, and to do it, I'm going to um, let's just import that. Uh, I'll make use of a method I'm going to write that's going to be particularly bad. Okay, so I'm going to call my uh, method slow random int and I'm just going to return an int and um, basically I'm going to create some kind of list so for list uh, that can be a mutable list of uh, integer um, and then I'm going to put loads of numbers in it uh, and then we're going to take them out by random one by one, which is a really bad way of doing things. So don't actually use this if you ever want to generate a random number. But it should take a long time to do. So, um, oh, I think we've got to about 500,000. Uh, and we'll add uh, all those numbers to our list. Uh, OK, so we've got a list of half a million numbers. And then I'm going to create a random number generator. Um, and we'll just import that. And um, basically, while we've got um, uh, more than one number left, so while the, uh, the list.count is greater than one, I'm going to. Um, Find a random number, so get random index val rand index, and we're going to use our random generator to uh, find an integer that is within the bounds of the size of the list and take one out. Okay, so as I say, this is bad, bad, bad code. Um, So basically, we're putting load numbers in the list and then removing them at random to see what we're left with, rather than just you know generating a random number. So um, okay, so let's uh, let's try that out. We click the get random button. Um, we might set our text view 
text to something like uh, please wait um, and then just so we know that it's working uh, and then we'll say something like um, val num equals slow random int which should take some time um, and then we'll say that the text view dot text is going to equal our number we need to make that a string so we can do some templating like that okay so let's run that and see what happens hopefully this computer is not too fast if, if it is we'll make the num num set of numbers bigger and slow it down some more uh, might want to unzoom that Okay, so our application's launched. We hit the button. Okay, um, hasn't actually got as far as updating the text view, but I can't interact with it anymore. If I click button, nothing's happening. Um, if we wait long enough, the fans on my Mac will probably like start to spin up. Um, but yeah, nothing's nothing's happening. But I can't interact with it anymore. Still thinking, and we get this. Anyone got an Android phone and seen that before? Yeah. Okay. So this is this is less than ideal. Okay, now I imagine we could click wait and then eventually, hopefully eventually, we will get a number appear in our um, text view. Um, I haven't got any sort of indicator of progress, so um, we'll leave it running for now. Maybe it will, maybe it will get there. Um, so we kind of need a way around this, this problem. We'll leave it going and, uh, and have a look. And that's, that's the idea of a thread. Okay, so we can send our long running task off to a different thread to be executed. Okay, um, uh, and then um, our application will still continue to be responsive, even if we've maybe not got the response that we need. So, um, it's by the sounds of it, it's still going because I can still hear the fans. But while it's still going, we'll we'll, we'll put it into a thread um, and, and see if we can improve things uh, somewhat. Hopefully, eventually, we'll also see that it is actually working and we'll get a response. But um, we'll check that again in a minute before I run it. So to do that. What we might do is something like this. We create a thread, okay? So we can say something like val thread equals thread. Now, um, a thread, um, basically, we create a thread, and the constructor for a thread requires uh, any object that implements uh, the runnable interface. And the runnable interface has one method called run, okay? I can't believe there's a typo on my screenshot for the slides, but never mind. Um, so we could just write our long running task here, where my typo is, OK? But just like implementing a non-click uh, listener, um, we can uh, use the optimizations that we've got in Kotlin to where we've got one, um, one uh, method in the interface. We can actually essentially omit that code and just write thread brackets. And what we go in here is placed automatically into the run um, method. OK, so we do it the long way, and then we'll, we'll fix it to the short way. Have we actually got our random number yet? No, we're still still waiting. OK, so we do uh, thread. OK, and as we say, our thread it is instantiated with some kind of object that implements runnable. So we can make an anonymous object. And if we do that, it will say, oh, the object doesn't implement the, um, the interface. So we can click on that and choose implement members, pick to choose run, and then we can write our code here. And what we actually want that to do is to um, go ahead and get the random number, OK? But that random number won't be in scope, so we also need our text view to be here, uh, access from here to, to use it. But um, let's just see if it has worked. I just want to actually show you that we will get a random number eventually, but I think it's still thinking about it. Yep, still thinking about it. Um, so, um, we will have a problem if we just do this, OK? Um, in order that we can do it at a more useful speed, I'm going to drop the uh, number down by 10%, and hopefully we'll actually see it. Yeah, it's still not responding. Uh, yeah, we're not getting there, are we? Um, but we'll, uh, we'll just see um, what happens if we do this. So. It's going to complain to us because we're, we're missing something. Oh, we're also missing one other thing, and that is it's all well and good creating a thread, but if we don't tell the thread to start, then nothing will happen. Okay, so that will start off the thread. 
So our application will still be responsive. So when we click on that button, you'll still see the little animation on it. Um, it would obviously start the calculation over again, uh, but it should work rather than freezing up. I think I chose rather a large number to test it because it's still going and my fans are still running at full power. So I'm going to give up and stop it. Uh, and I'll run it uh, like this. And actually, rather than put it out straight out of the text view, I'm going to log it out so we can see that it does work. Um, and then we'll see what happens when we try and put it in the text view. So I'm just going to do like log dot. I'll log it as a as an error so it's easy to spot. Um, uh, main activity, and we'll log out that um, num. Uh, probably wants me to put it into a string, I imagine. Okay, so just to see that that's working, we've reduced the amount of time it should take by a factor of ten. So. Um, Let's try that now. OK, so we hit the button. It's changed to please wait. But it's I can click the button again. It's not lost. It's not become non-interactive. OK, um, I might still have got too large a number. But maybe if we wait a few more seconds, we might get lucky and actually get a result. Um, oh, our result's going to be logged out, isn't it? So let's have a look in the uh, in the log. Uh, and let's put that on error, so we get less output. Doesn't look like it's been logged out yet. Uh, 14, 10, we haven't supposed to, haven't got any, that's not a problem. That's OK. Oh, there we go. There's our log. We got our value, 48,000. And because I clicked it a few times, it's continued to execute. Um, and we've got another number uh, come out as well. OK, so that's all well and good. If instead of logging it, I try and put in a text view, however, and run that again, I'm just going to make this even quicker by making it uh, 100,000. Run it again. Hit my button. OK, it's actually terminated. It's, it's thrown an exception. OK, and if we have a look at that, and look in the output here, and scroll up, we can see we've got this message, only the original thread that created a view hierarchy can touch its views. So we're in a different thread. We can't update the view. Okay. Um, so the solution to that is at the point we need to update it, we have to call another method that belongs to the activity, which is uh, run on UI thread. And that also takes an object that implements runnable. And in the same way we, we've done up here, we can do, um, we can kind of, um, make use of the optimizations, it means we don't have to specify that. And we can update the text view here. So if I try it again now, there we go. We're, we're seeing um, some output. OK. Now, obviously, we wouldn't normally write a really bad random number generator. Um, but we might make requests over a network that could take some time. So. Uh, oh. So yeah, we've seen this. We've seen the app not responding. We know what, what that looks like. Um, we can use this run on UI thread to go back. There are a couple of other options, OK? Um, or one other option, which is um, a view has a method called post. And we can use that method and pass in, our, um, pass in what code we want to run instead. Um, depends what we want to do. Obviously, we need access to a view to do that, which we might not have, depending on where we are. So uh, run on UI threads are a good sort of um, a good option there. So um, I mentioned about network requests. Um, so a lot of mobile applications uh, work on the basis that they retrieve data from, some, from somewhere else. Okay? Um, they don't just exist on the phone. They're not like standalone apps. They tend to have network access. Um, and typically, in order to do that, they might access some kind of application programmable interface, okay? which is any kind of interface against which we can program, kind of defined in the name. There are plenty of public APIs we can use uh, all with all sorts of different information that we can get hold of. Um, some of them require authentication. Others don't. Um, so there are lots of public ones where you can just ask for data, um, and you'll get that data um, back, and you can do something with it. Um, a lot of modern APIs are something called RESTful. REST stands for Representational State Transfer. And basically what that means is um, 
the same kind of HTTP requests that we might put in if we visit, uh, if we go to, you know, we type a web address in a URL in a browser and hit enter, uh, that browser is going to send a GET request to the server. Um, if we fill in a form uh, within a web page and hit a button, there's a fair chance that it will use a POST request to send that data to the server. Okay, um, and when we program with web APIs, we can use those same um, GET and POST um, verbs along with some other uh, verbs like PUT and DELETE. Um, We'll only be using get today, but there are plenty of others. Um, when we put in a request, rather than getting back HTML, like we would if we went to a, a regular web page, um, we typically get back something like JavaScript object notation. Okay, So we get like structured data that we can do something with. It might not be JavaScript object notation. It might not be JSON. It might be XML or YAML. Okay, um, That will depend on uh, the API and possibly depend on the type of request that we send. Um, <coughs> Some APIs will look at the headers in the HTTP request that we send and see if we can accept JSON or XML and then make a decision as to what to send back. Um, as I said already, you can make a GET request by, by typing in a URL into the browser. Um, so we can kind of have a look at what might come back from a, a, an API simply by doing, doing that. Okay. So I'm going to create a very basic application today. Um, how many of you have um, seen the TV show Parks and Recreation? One. OK, two. So there's a character in it called Ron Swanson. There's an API that gets quotes from him from the show. It's a very simple API to use. The quotes are moderately amusing. So we're going to use that to, um, to create an application that's going to go away to the API, pull some data from it, and uh, put, it on the, put it inside our application. So. Um, I'm going to create a new app to do that, I think. Um, I'll call it wrong quotes. And I'll just start again with an empty activity. And actually, we're going to set it up pretty much just like the last app, where we had a button and uh, a label. Um, so once it's woken up, and I can get to my uh, layout, uh, make a bit of space so we can see it, I'm going to delete the existing text view. I'm going to add a button at the top there. Um, I'm going to change the button text to get quote, and I'll fix that into a string in a minute. And I'm going to add a text view uh, underneath it. And I'm going to expand the text view so we've got a fair bit of space uh, for it. And I'm going to set the number of lines for the, the um, text view as well. I don't actually know if I have to do that, but um, it would seem <coughs> sensible. So we said it's, I don't know, six lines just in case. So I don't want the text that comes into text view by default. So we can take that text out. But I do want the text for the button. And it's going to tell me that, um, OK, we're missing some constraints. So let's fix the constraints with the fix button. And I've got some hard coded text. So I'll just extract a string resource to solve that. OK, so I've got button and I've got space for my, um, for my quote. So what do we need to do? Well, um, we need uh, the quote to be hooked up to a button. So just like before, we can add a um, on-click event for it, if I can find where it is. Oh, on-click. Uh, I think we'll call it quote pressed. I don't know, something like that. Um, and then we'll implement a function here with the same name, fun quote pressed. And that has to take a parameter of a view which we'll have to import. Come on. No, don't exclude it from completion. Uh, there we go, import. OK, so what do we want to happen? Well, we know that um, we want, uh, we're want we going to need to make our request using a thread. OK. We also need to know how, where on earth we're going to make the request for our API. OK. So, um, with any API, we need to probably read a little bit about the documentation for it, and we need to find it first. So I'm just going to type Ron Swanson API into Google. Um, and I think it's the one at the top here. OK, so actually, we've got the, the whole source of this guy's um, API, but um, we, we know where it is. It's located here. Um, and we've got a bit of information about the API that tells us if we make a, a call to this URL, i.e., this one here, it will give us an array with one quote in JSON format. 
and if we make a call to that URL and pass um, a, a count in um, as well, we'll get that number of items in the URL. So it's a very trivial uh, API. There are much more complex APIs out there. Um, and when you come to do your assignments, you'll be doing something where you use an API. Um, you have pretty much free reign on what API you use. Obviously, the more complex API you use, the more potential for marks there are. Um, we're doing a very trivial one today. So let's have a quick look at what happens if we try and visit this, this API. So I'm going to click that. It's actually taken me um, to, to the URL. And because I'm in Firefox, it's given me this sort of preview in JSON format. And I can see it's an array. And the first item in the array at index 0 is a quote. Okay. If I click raw data, we can see what that looks like um, in, in raw JSON. Okay. Similarly, if I made a, a call to it and passed in that I wanted seven quotes, I'd get the same. Again, it's automatically formatted it for me, but I can click on raw data. Um, now it's not formatted at all. If I do pretty print, I get a kind of, it figures out that each item in the array is separated by comma um, and shows me them. Okay, so we, we can see how it works. We can see the data that is coming back. And we know that the data is in JSON uh, format. So um, I only want to display one quote at a time. So the API uh, address I need is this. OK. Um, and I'm going to go and just put that into my application for now. Uh, let's just start up here. Uh, var API URL. And we'll paste that in. OK. Um, we're missing a protocol. OK. Uh, I happen to know, because it went wrong in the first class, that this uh, runs either over HTTP or HTTPS. Um, configuring a Android application to um, make a call over uh, HTTP, i.e. Not, not secure, um, is a bit of a pain. And it's a pain for a good reason. Because if your application makes calls to a H over HTTP, that's not secure. So the data that we send, which OK, in this case, is only a URL, doesn't really matter, goes over plain text. If we're building an application and that application can collect data from the user and that application sends that data over the internet in plain text, that does not look after the user in any way, shape, or form because their, their private data could be going out over the public web. Um, I happen to know that this, uh, as I say, this particular API also works over HTTPS. Um, and that's fine. Because, and we will use that. OK. If you use HTTP, you'll get an error. Um, and you should. It is possible to get over the error. I looked into it between the first class and the second class. But you really should think carefully about whether you want to, um, to uh, get over the error, because you might be putting the user's uh, data at risk. Um, so uh, don't really, in most cases, you don't want to be doing that. OK, so we've got the API for the URL, and we know about the um, URL. We also know that a network request might take time. We don't know how good our user's internet connection may be. They might not even have one. Um, we don't know how much data we're going to get. It. Well, we do in this case, but we don't necessarily know how much data we're waiting to receive. So we don't want to run it without putting it in a thread. And in fact, if you try and do it without creating a thread, it will just say no um, and won't let you do it. Uh, don't, I think it'll either um, terminate or won't even compile a current bridge. So we'll create a thread. Um, and because it's easy to forget, I'm going to tell the thread to start once we've created it, because otherwise uh, nothing might happen. So I forgot to do that previously. Make sure we put it in. It should work. Um, OK, let's just check that quote pressed matches, because it's grayed out. Ah, my own click has disappeared. I thought I typed it in. OK. There we go. OK, I could have sworn I typed that in, but anyway. So um, we've got a thread. OK. Um, we can start off by creating a URL object. So we can say something like val URL equals URL and pass in our API URL. Um, and we need to import that. OK, so that gives us a URL. Uh, the next stage uh, is to uh, create a connection uh, to that URL. So we can say val connection, connection, yep, equals URL dot open connection. Um, now, that, by default, open connection returns um, a URL connection. Okay, But we actually need to set some properties that are specific to an HTTP URL connection. And we know we're making a HTTP connection because that's the protocol that's in use here. Okay, So we can specify, actually, this connection needs to be opened as a 
HTTP URL connection. Now you might think that's dangerous if we actually took the time to read the documentation for this. You would see that if for the URLs protocol such as HTTP or JAR there exists a public specialized URL connection subclass belonging to one of the following packages, uh, the connection return will be of that subclass. So actually um, for HTTP, a HTTP URL connection will be returned. So we do know that that's okay to do because it says so in the documentation. So should be good. We, we also need to specify some parameters, like how long do we want to bother waiting to get a connection? You know, if the server's down, do we want them to wait for a year, a week, a day, a minute, a second? Um, so we can specify connect timeout. So we can say connection dot connect timeout. And that's in milliseconds. So if we do like 10,000, that's 10 seconds. Um, we also want to see how long do we want to wait to actually read the data. OK. Now, um, so there's a, a read timeout, read timeout. Um, and again, I don't know, we'd set 10 seconds for this. In the real world, that could mean that our user in theory could wait 20 seconds. I don't think that's, I think that's a bit long. So I guess it kind of depends on what you're doing as to how long we set these. But um, if we don't get a connection within 20 seconds, we probably want to give up anyway. And then we also need to specify what type of uh, request we're making, OK? so. Um, we talked about having get methods, the different HTTP verbs. So we're going to create a, um, a get method. OK? Uh, and we can specify that. Um, for some reason, it, it goes in as a string. There's not a, an enum or anything for that. And then we uh, go ahead and connect. OK. So at that point, we should be connected to the, the server, and we should get some kind of response back. OK? And it's that response we want to do something with. So we might see something like val uh, response. Well, actually, before we get a response, um, let's say I typed that URL wrong, and um, the thing that I typed in didn't exist. What, what would we get back? What do you get back if you type in a URL that doesn't exist in your web browser? 404. OK. So we get a response code. OK. Typically, with, a, with most websites, as well as just getting um, a response code, we might also get some HTML that says, sorry, this page cannot be found, or a picture of an angry cat or something. Who knows? Um, but with the API, we should get response codes. We want to check that the response is actually OK. Um, so um, we can look for response code, which is going to be our connection dot response code. OK, that's an integer. What do we want it to be? Anybody know? So 404, not good. What? Yeah, 200. Yeah. OK. So we could say something like if response code uh, is equal to 200. Um, but uh, we can actually um, use uh, um, uh, uh, a definition of that, uh, a static um, variable on HTTP URL connection. So we can say if response code is equal to HTTP URL connection dot and then we've got HTTP OK. And as you said, if we look at actually the definition of that, it's 200. OK. So similarly, there will be probably one that's called HTTP not found. There we go. HTTP not found 404. So um, there we go. So OK, let's say we've got OK back. Um, we'll do something with it. Let's just um, else uh, we might say. Um, Bad response from server. And we'll handle that in a minute. OK. So, so far, things hopefully are going well. Um, what we get back from that um, is um, uh, some, some data. OK. And it comes in the form of an input stream. So, we can say something like val stream equals um, uh, connection dot input stream. OK. Now, do we know anything about streams? Have we ever used like streams before? So a stream is like a like a, maybe a stream, like a series of data that we we would have to sort of handle maybe a bit after a bit after a bit because that data might not come in all at one go. Okay. Have we ever used anything maybe in Java where something might not come in all at one go? When we built our applications, our command line applications last year, how did we get data in? We typed it in the console, yeah? OK. So essentially, that's like a stream of data. 
And what do we use to read that stream of data? Last year? Scanner, yeah. OK, cool. So we can use the scanner to read the data from this input stream. So rather than putting in a variable, we can say something like, um, uh, we'll create a scanner. Uh, obviously, we're in Kotlin, so we don't have to do new scanner, which is like scanner. And then we need to provide, so instead of giving system.in, OK, um, which I think is probably a system.in, yeah, it's an input stream, um, we can provide it with the connections input stream. OK, so that gets us uh, an input stream into a scanner. And we know how to use a scanner, OK? We can like do um, if scanner.hasnext and then scanner.nextline or whatever. Um, I'm actually interested in reading just everything that's come in, OK? So there's different ways we could do that. We could say something like um, var input equals an empty string. Oops, an empty string. And then we could say um, while scanner dot has next then uh, input um, plus equals scanner dot next um, that's one way of doing it okay again we're, we're building a string without a string builder which is maybe not ideal um, but you might think how oh, this seems like a little bit bit messy come we just want everything that's coming back we want the whole response so other people have thought about that too and the um, if you do a bit of a Google You'll find quite a nice solution where we can actually set this. We can, we can, um, if you did the task last year when we read from a CSV file, um, uh, we can actually specify how we want to. In fact, it was in the Poke Tutor tutorial. We can, we can split what we're reading using a delimiter. We can specify what that delimiter is. Okay. So rather than say, okay, well, we'll just get each next bit from the scanner, we could actually say to the scanner, we only want you to stop giving us data when you get to the end of the stream. And we can do that by saying scanner.delimiter. Was it use delimiter or delimiter? Let me check. Yeah, use delimiter. And then we need to give it a specific pattern that looks like this. And that basically means um, read in everything until you get to the end of the file. Okay. In the tutorial, you can see where I borrowed that from. It was a Stack Overflow answer. Um, where I think other people had had the same query I did. So I had a look. That delimiter basically says, keep going until you get to the end of the file. So that's what's happening there. OK. So we then need to get read that into some sort of string. So we might say something like val JSON data, because we know it's come back as JSON. Um, uh, we can do like scanner dot uh, next. OK. But it's possible that the scanner hasn't got anything because we could have an empty response. So a safer bet is to say, um, actually, is there any data? And if there is, we can get it from the scanner. And we can do that with like an inline if else statement. So we say if uh, scanner dot has next, then um, we give it what's next. Else, we just give an empty string. So by the time we get to the end of this statement, we've either got an empty string of JSON data, i.e. nothing in it, or if the scanner had something, then it was whatever the scanner had, and the scanner would it would give us everything up until the end of the file. So we've got some JSON data. Okay, so we're now at a point where we could kind of think, okay, is this working? We haven't necessarily put it back in our view, um, but we could we could we could log it out. Um, again, just just to get it working on the log it out. I know it's not an error really, but um, it makes it easier to to see. Um, so main activity, and we'll log the. Based on data. Okay, so all being well, we should see a quote appear in our in our log. So I turn on the log, set that to error. I know it's not an error because we've been a bit naughty, but um, I will run it and see what happens. So start up our application. There is bound to be a mistake. There were lots of them earlier, so good chance of one here. OK, so let's have a look at why there is a mistake. Um, and we'll scroll up. OK, so here we go. Permission denied, missing internet permission. OK, so we need to make sure that um, when our users install our application, that they are warned that um, this application may access the internet. OK, there might be data charges associated with accessing the internet. Um, or uh, you might have device restrictions if it's like a company issued mobile that says, oh, these apps, you can't use apps to access the internet. 
Um, we have to say in the um, Android manifest file that that's what we want to do. So we actually have to modify the Android manifest file and say that we want permission. Okay. So hopefully I can get this right. So somewhere in the manifest, not inside application, we can add a tag which is like uses permission. And then the permission that we want is uh, internet. So somewhere in here, internet is a permission for internet. Okay. Um, oh, no, this is a self closing tag. There we go. Okay. So if we try it again, um, if the user was installing the app, they'd get a this application will need to access the internet prompt. Okay. Um, so we can run that. And let's try again. OK, so there we go. If we look in the log, we've got this, um, we've got this quote output. OK, you can still see it still in JSON format. Uh, we've still got the quote around the, the actual quote. I know it is a quote, but the quote marks are not part of the, the data. Um, they're actually part of the JSON formatting. And we've got the brackets for the array. So we need really to do something about getting that uh, um, quote into non-JSON format. And when you come to the assignment, you'll hopefully be looking at a more complex uh, return of data from the uh, API, uh, whichever you choose to use, because you can't use this particular one. Um, so we need to think about how we might do that. So we could attempt to write the code here, and we will do that first of all. Um, fortunately, we have access in Android to um, some classes that are designed to handle JSON data. Okay, so we could write something like um, uh, val JSON array. Oh, JSON. I don't really know whether to how to capitalize things. We'll go with that. Uh, val JSON array equals, and we can create a JSON array object. There we go, JSON array, and we can pass in a string. So we can pass in our JSON data. Okay, this only works because we know it's an array because we've read the documentation for the API. So um, if it wasn't, we might have some problems. So that creates a JSON array object. Now, we're just interested in the item at the, fir the first thing in that JSON array. So then we might say something like uh, val quote equals uh, JSON array. And because it's an array, we can use the like regular array access index thing. Like We can put like a square brackets. Um, and that will get us the first item uh, in the quote. But uh, we need to convert it to a string, because it's an array of presumably some sort of JSON things. So we can call to string on it. Okay. Now, because I know it's, it doesn't seem like much, um, this bit could be a bit more complicated. I think it's better to extract it out into a method. Okay. We could copy and paste it and write the method ourselves, but Android will do that for us. So we can right click, we can choose ex refactor, extract, function. Um, we can give it a name. So uh, we'll call it um, process JSON. Okay. And now what it's done is create a method called process JSON, which takes the data, um, retakes a quote, doesn't actually return anything, so we need to fix that. We need it to return a string, um, and then we want it to return that, and then process JSON up here. We can do something like val quote equals. That way, if we modify the application to read from a different API, um, and that API provided data in a different format, um, we could still use this, this code here, but we could modify this to do the work that we needed it to do. OK, so let's log that out instead. And we should see now we don't have the brackets in the quote. So let's restart application. Hit get quote. And there we can see if I could hide that. Ah, go away. Yes, I know. Uh, there we go. We've got a quote, and it's no longer in quotation marks or brackets. So we're most of the way there. Um, what we also need to do is to update our text view. Okay, so uh, we need to put that quote. We can get rid of our logging now. So, how do we do that? What method do I need to call in order to um, put the code into my text view? Can I just write text view text? Anyone remember from earlier? No. If I jump back to the slides. We've got to do this run on UI thread. Okay. Or we could find the view and use post. Um, but we can do run on UI thread. Run on UI thread. Um, and in there we can say text view dot text equals quote. Okay. Again, um, I know it's not much, but I'm going to extract it out. And that's because chances are 
we might need to handle what appears if there's a bad response from the server. We might use that same text box to do it. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extract that into a method. I think I'll call it something like update text view. So let's, um, let's do that, refactor. Well, let's do it by hand this time, uh, just so you can kind of see the process. So I'm going to cut that. I'm going to create a, a method, uh, update text box from thread. Uh, text string, and then we're going to say that our text view, oh, text view, bad method, bad name, there we go, text view, uh, dot text equals text. But I need to put it in that run on UI thread, so I can say run on UI thread and pop it in there. Okay, and come back to here, we can say uh, update text view and pass in the quote. It's all been well, that will work. Let's try it out. OK, so there we go. We've got a quote. Click it again, get a different quote. Click it again, get another quote. OK, um, we might need to handle things that are going wrong. So firstly, we could have got a bad response from the server. OK, the web might be down, might not respond, or might be like a down for maintenance. So if we get that, we might want to say, oh, look, we can call our update text view from thread, because it's already there. And we might say, uh, sorry, there's a problem with the server. OK. Um, the other things that could go wrong are that um, you know we might not even be able to open the connection for some reason. So it might be a good idea to put this inside a try block, okay? Uh, and then we could catch any exception, which would like to be an IO exception. I will give it a name e. Um, and then we could say something like update text view from text thread uh, from thread. Uh, sorry, the was an error processing the data. So we've kind of handled different errors that, that um, could come along. Okay. One other thing just to mention is, although we read the documentation um, and we know that we can open a connection, it comes back as a HTTP URL connection, um, generally a safer bet is to actually check if it is a HTTP URL, HTTP URL connection before we continue. OK, so what we could do is we could do something like this. We could say if um, URL.open connection, well, actually, let's do it here. Let's take that for a second. We say if connection is HTTP URL connection, and then we'd have all the code that we want underneath. So we just cut that one there, and I think Hopefully, I've closed it in the right place. Um, before the catch, at least, yeah. So now um, we're getting what's called a smart cast. You can see it's gone green. And basically, this code will only execute if connection is a HTTP URL connection. So because we've checked it, it can now behave as a HTTP URL connection. Chances are, unless someone came along and changed the protocol on this URL, which is highly unlikely, uh, it wouldn't be a problem. But um, this is a, a, a maybe a safer bet. And we could add like an else. So let me find the right bracket. Uh, else um, log uh, main activity uh, someone changed the um, API protocol. OK, because that shouldn't happen. So. I think the, that's the appropriate log category for that. Um, OK, so all being one, nothing really should have changed unless we happen to get managed to run the demo and the server happens to go down. All being well, run application and we're still getting our quotes. OK, um, we're getting there. So um, we talked about typecasting. OK, so we read that bit of documentation about the creating URL connection, what type it comes back as. We originally did a cast. Um, actually, a safer bet is probably to, to check the type and use the smart cast. It's just slightly safer. Um, we don't get an exception thrown. We can handle the error uh, as need to be. OK, 
there's quite a lot of code there, right? Um, we've got like all this stuff about connection, and we've got handle like returning to a, a thread, main thread, and, and all that. Um, you know, people make network requests all the time, um, and sometimes they need to make more complicated network requests. So, for example, you might want to retrieve images as part of your application. Um, and those images, you might want to actually be able to cache them. So if you, uh, let's say you're on Facebook on your mobile phone, uh, chances are when you, when you go on Facebook and it downloads a picture, that picture is actually cached on your device for some time. So that if you reload Facebook at a later point in time or scroll back up in the list, it doesn't go back to the server and get that image straight away. It uses a cached copy. Okay. Now, we could do all of that kind of stuff by hand, but that's kind of painful. So people tend to make networking libraries available, um, and there's loads of libraries available for Android, um, that we can include in our project and do things uh, with less code on our part. Okay, So we're going to have a quick look at how we might do handle come some of this networking code, which is a bit, you know, it's, it's about as short as I could make it, but it's, there's still a fair bit to it. Um, so um, it's actually relatively straightforward. So if I type in something like Android networking library, 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 OK, um, we'll see uh, all sorts. Um, and there is actually one that's supported by Google. Um, so and here we go, Volley Overview Android Developers. OK, it says here, Volley is a HTTP library that makes networking on Android apps easier and, more importantly, faster. Well, that sounds kind of good for me. OK, um, and we can actually have a look at the code for Volley. But we don't have to download the code ourselves and like incorporate in our project um, because it's actually quite easy to uh, incorporate. It says here, the easiest way to add volley to your project is to add the following dependency in your apps build.gradle file. OK, that looks kind of easy, right? Um, it says you can also clone it, but as I say, this looks even easier. So we can copy that. We can go to uh, Android Studio. We can go to our um, build.gradle for the module, just to we're in the module one. Um, and we can add that as an implementation. Now, the code on the website suggested using compile. And if we type that in, it's going to give us a warning when we click sync now. <coughs> Somewhere, eventually. Where is the warning? Not there. Can I find it? To do, to build, build. Oh, give me it before. OK. It should give me a warning. It should basically say event log, maybe? No. I don't know where it is. Look at. OK. Well, I can't find where my output should have come um, from adding that. But what we should have is a warning saying that compile has been depre deprecated, and we should use a keyword implementation instead. OK. Um, I just can't find where it has gone. So I will fix it anyway. You can be assured that that warning should have appeared somewhere. Um, it will. I think it will work, but um, we're meant to use implementation. So I'll hit sync now again. OK, now obviously that doesn't help because I haven't actually read about how I need how to use volley. OK, so what we do here is then go back to documentation and, oh, look, here we go, send a simple request. So let's have a look at that. Uh, so at a high level, you use volley by creating a request queue and passing it request objects. The request queue manages worker threads. Oh, look, we don't have to worry about threading ourselves. Even better. Um, uh, reading and writing from to the cache. So it's got caching. Um, and um, parsing the raw responses. Okay. Um, it tells us we need the internet permission, but we know that because we've already come across that problem. And here's some example code, even in Kotlin, to help us with that. So. Um, what we're doing, we're instancing a request queue, we're requesting a string from the URL, and then we're adding it to a queue. And then we've got in here some kind of response where we do something um, as a result. And you can see here it's updating a text view. So I'm just going to blanket copy and paste this code in. Um, obviously, if I was doing this for assignment, at this point I would be putting a reference in to uh, this particular page. But um, I'm not, so I'm not going to bother. Um, so before I. I might have to go back and copy it. But actually, at the moment, I've got all my logic for getting the quote inside this quote pressed method. Um, rather than deleting it, I'm going to extract it and put it in its own method, which I'll call something like um, retrieve quote. So let's just right click, and we can just do refactor, extract, function, um, request 
quote. OK, so we haven't really changed anything. We've just put request to quote uh, as its own thing. But I'm not going to use that instead. I'm going to create, I'm going to maybe do, um, let's do something like request quote with volley. OK, well, I haven't written that method. Will it let me write, let me generate one? Generate, oh, not go to. Generate. Come on. I'm just being really lazy now. Implement methods. No. Um, OK, I'll do it by hand then. Private fun request quote with. There we go. OK, so that code that I needed, I copied. So I can paste it in. A few things that we need to do. One is to Im import volley. So, you know, you can right click import volley. We also need to import a string request. We also need to re import response. Um, and we need to import request. OK. When you request, it gives me like, what's that, seven options. Um, we need to be careful here, because the top one might not be volley. It, it wasn't earlier. I think it's because I've used it recently that it is. Um, so if we get the choice, you need to make sure you choose the right import statement. Otherwise, we'll get some sort of other request object, and it won't work. So we're using volley. So you can see com.android.volley.request. OK. So we're most of the way there, except we don't want the URL to be Google. So we can get rid of that. We've already got our URL, which is up here, API URL. So we can copy that down here. OK. And then actually, it's just coincidence that their text view happens to be called text view, and so does mine. Um, and actually, all I want is the response. But in this case, it's going to give us like part of the response. I want to take the response I've got, process it with my little method for processing JSON. So I can say something like um, val quote equals process JSON and pass in the um, response. And then I can set my text to quote. OK. So if we now look at it, um, if we just tidy it up a little bit so it looks a bit neater, there isn't that much to it. Um, that's not comment relative to what we're doing. Um, that is a lot shorter than this code here that we had. Um, and we've even got some error handling. OK, it just says that didn't work, but we could change the error message. Um, we might want to te test it, so let's just run it again. Check that we still get the exact same response we had before. Hooray, we get it. Um, that on bowling is part of the quote. That's why it's in square brackets. If I click it again, there we go. Um, it's uh, it's exactly as it was. Um, you might think that's great. Why don't we just use uh, libraries for everything? OK. Um, one is you are introducing an awful lot of code into your project that you have not created. And depending on where that library has come from, now this one's come from Google, so I would hope that we can trust it to some extent. Um, but we don't know. Now, what we could do is we could actually go and look at the, um, you know, it says that we can download it from GitHub. So we could go to uh, GitHub. Where's the link? I think it was an overview. We could go to Volley on GitHub. There we go. It is Google's. Um, what did we just do? We made a request, so we could we can know uh, we could dive into the repository um, and have a look at what request is, um, and we can see the code. But I mean, we're looking at hundreds of hundreds of lines of code, and that's just one class. So um, there is kind of a, 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 a is it really worth it? You know, we've saved in our own in the code that we've written. We've maybe saved 40 or 50 lines, uh, but we have had to include, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of lines of code um, just to add the, the volley library. So you want to be judicious with your use of uh, libraries. You know, Do you need it? Um, it, it where does it come from? Who's the author? Um, do we trust them? Um, at least if you can inspect the source code for something like this, then um, if you've got time, you can have a look at it. As I say, I hope we can trust Google. Probably can, but you never know. Um, so it's whether or not it's it's the best thing to do. So yeah, we could add some kind of vulnerability, especially if if it's um, you know if it's not a well used library and hasn't really had um, uh, much in terms of people looking through it. Um, but it can make our life 
uh, easier. And as you saw, it was really easy to add. We just added implementation and the name of the package. Um, and, and that package was then added when we synced the project. And we could just start using it. We didn't have to faff around with any sort of adding any code into our project or anything like that. It was, it was pretty easy.